Hi, welcome. I'm Fran Costigan. Maybe you can see that on my shirt. Some of you know me. And welcome to the January 2024 live event for Essential Vegan Desserts at Ruby. Um, I just started, it seems like last month I laughed too when I was saying hello. This is the first live event of 2024 and I'm very happy that you're here to spend the next little bit of time hour or so with me. I want to get to as many of your questions as possible. I imagine I'll be able to do that. Um, I'm welcome you, welcoming you into my home kitchen, which was renovated about six months ago. If you've been looking or if you've joined me at my previous live events last year, the year before, the year before, actually in February, we're going to do I think it's the eighth annual Valentine's Day live event. So for that many years, you will see a difference in my kitchen. And because I am a recipe developer and um, consultant, and I spend a lot of time creating recipes, testing recipes, I need a kitchen that works. And believe me, I have had little teeny kitchens. I've had bigger kitchens. We can all make our kitchens work. We're here to talk about a baking kitchen, but most of us, I'm, I'm not talking about people in restaurants, most of us are creating desserts within a space where we're also doing our savory food, the food that gives us our health. So I'm going to get right into the topic, but I want to go over a couple of things first. If you have a question to ask me right on the right side of your screen of the dashboard, you will see an area where you can put a question in and I will answer your question. I might ask you for some clarification. I particularly want to welcome my Essential Vegan Dessert students. A whole bunch of new students have recently started. If you haven't already joined the Facebook group for Essential Vegan Desserts, and that's for anyone who has graduated or is in process in any way, please join the group. It's a great way to get to say hello to your to your cohort to ask a question. Oh, I'm looking for a new mixer. What do you recommend? What do you not recommend? Things like that. If you have questions of a technical nature, write to support at ruby.com and someone from our great team will get back to you quickly. And everyone here know that you can write to me at fran at ruby.com and I'll be happy to chat with you, answer any questions that you may have. So let's get into this topic, uh, which is setting up a kitchen space that's comfortable for you so that you will be able to work with ease and I hope joy. Being in my kitchen is really my happy place. It wouldn't be um, a stretch to say this is actually a meditation for me. I just love creating from ingredients. It feels like magic to me. Now, if you've been watching my live events for some time, you will notice that there has been a change. I had a kitchen with dark cabinets and um, it was completely closed in. I have a beautiful view over here of I'm on the 30th floor of my building. I see the river in Philadelphia. It's gorgeous, but I had a completely closed kitchen. And when I decided to move here, Charlene Nolan, my very good friend and Ruby colleague, Chef Shark, came over and said, you know, I see why you want the apartment. My daughter said, well, I see why you want the apartment, but you've never had a closed kitchen before. And that's true, except for my very, very first kitchen. <laughs> if you could call it that, I couldn't turn around practically without hitting my nose 
um, when I was first married and we were both students, all of my kitchens have been open spaces. And at the time I thought, well, it's long and there's nice counter space. Maybe it will be nice for a change to have a separate room. There was, it was lacking in storage. And so I was able to figure out things to do. And again, I really want to say we can all, we all have different size spaces and we can jerry rig everything. So I'm going to ask Patrick to show you a photograph of my previous kitchen. There I am in the front. I found it in my photos and thought, gee, not only do you have a new kitchen, but I've certainly had a lot of different hairstyles. I think that you can see there was a long counter toward the end where the kitchen was closed off and there was nothing underneath it. What I did was I had brought with me from my New York apartment two narrow metro shelves. I think metro shelves are just great because that kitchen wasn't very spacious at all. And I had one cut down to fit underneath the counter. And that held my mixing bowls and my sheet pans, as you can see, and pots and pans. And as time went on, I thought, well, I need more space. So I purchased some heavy duty metal shelves from a restaurant supply store and had them put up and they held other things. I used every space. I had a pot rack, I had hooks, magnetic knife rack, and it really served my purposes. However, what I didn't have was any depth to a counter. And so when I was doing big cakes or I had a larger project, then I would move into my living room. And I think some of you may do that. We want to be able to think out of the kitchen proper. Um, sometimes we have to do that. So my kitchen table got used or my dining room table actually um it that peg that metro shelf now is at uh, my friend alice's restaurant my joy cafe and the uh, i had a second one i had bought a pair when i was in new york on wheels and that became an extra island when i needed it and that's now out on my terrace because i don't need it um i do have too many baking pans and while I have been really going through through things, I mean, doing a renovation was a, after a move where I culled items and the renovation was a way for me to really look at what it was that I had and say, am I using this? Well, my baking dishes, my baking pans are many. They are too many, but I'm not ready to say goodbye to them yet. So what I have done is in the back of my apartment near my bedroom, there's a very, very large, very deep closet with shelves. And I've got those baking pans in there. And except for maybe one round pan, one muffin tin, which I had kept in my original kitchen here, everything was living there. Now I have room for my most used items in my kitchen, in this kitchen. On the other side of the island are deep, deep cabinets. So I have the things that I use the most, and that has worked very well for me. Um, I'm still going to look at <laughs> those baking items. For the renovation, so I, that's pretty much, I think you've seen everything on that photo. Now for the renovation, I did not consider every single cabinet and drawer and how I was going to use it. I actually liked the footprint of this kitchen and I didn't want to change it any more than I had to. I knew I was opening, this was a wall and the refrigerator was over here. I knew I was opening it up, but I really liked the configuration of the kitchen. And so that I'm, what I'm saying is I like the idea. It was small. I could go to my dishwasher, go to a cabinet, put everything away. I don't like having to walk a lot of spaces in a kitchen. And that's something that I learned by working in restaurant kitchens. You know, larger is not necessarily 
better. That's for sure. When it came to drawers here, however, where I'm standing right here, there's a beautiful set of drawers here. Then they open full and I've got equipment that I use for making things on this beautiful island right there. But I didn't want a second set. And I think that you can see I have a rolling rack, sometimes called a speed rack, that is, I had a completely a full-size one in one of my kitchens in New York, but it's really handy. And what I did was I made sure to measure the amount of space that I would have. Paper measurements don't always work out. We need to, when you're building something or, you know, measure twice, is that what they say? Or I would say measure twice when you're baking. So this will just slide right into a space and it's so handy because I can cool my baked goods right on there. I've got a place for my sheet pans. I've got a place for parchment paper. Um, it's just, and my gloves, it's, and everything. Uh, it's just really fabulous. I'm very, very happy about that. And that really came from thinking about the restaurants that I worked in in, the, uh, in New York. I worked in three restaurants in New York. And let me tell you, the spaces that I had to do my, my pastry stations were really small. And so it's really about organization. And I learned by working in restaurant kitchens that you keep like with like, you keep handy the things that you use the most. We use vertical space, always think about what you can hang. And as you use something in my kitchen, I wash and dry and put away in the restaurant kitchen, went right to the dishwasher. And if I needed something quickly, I'd say, Gee, I really need that quickly. Can you help me? So organization is really key and bigger is not always better. I did take what I learned to appreciate in the pro kitchens into my home. Store like with like. Most used tools and ingredients make them the most accessible, clean and put things away. Label ingredients. So I always have nearby my tape with a uh, marking pen, and sometimes I use labels, but I always label and date things. Think vertically. I have a knife rack this in the same place that it was before, and think outside of your kitchen for storage and workspace. As I said a little bit earlier, I was working on my dining room table sometimes, because I needed to, when I was designing this kitchen, I really knew, you know, I had a head start because I liked half of it the way that it was. And I knew I wanted a large counter where I would have space to work and there would be space for other people to work as well. But I didn't want to take any room in the kitchen to build a pantry. So what I did was just off the kitchen over there, just off the kitchen. As I come in, I had a big store, a big closet. I, I guess it's a coat closet, but I didn't need it because I had another one. And I had alpha units that I have had probably for 25 years that fit perfectly. They hold so much. So I have a photo for you to see inside my closet of the um, alpha units holding what would it's really become a pantry. And I've talked to other people about it and it seems that it's not very unique to do that. You know, you, you can do that. I have ingredients that I use more often behind me. I've got baking ingredients in my drawer down here that I use on a daily basis, but those are extras and it works really well. So thank you, Patrick. Um, I think that it, when you're, 
thinking about or pondering or wishing that you could set up your space differently, it can be frustrating. But if you think about, you know, if you get a little bit clever about it, it doesn't have to be. I have been in spaces in clients' homes, for example, some were enormous and some were tiny, where we put a big cutting board over part of the sink and use that. I am a big fan of rolling racks. So I showed you, I've got the, the speed rack that was here and I had a Metro cart on wheels. This is fantastic. And this is called an origami cart. I have a heavy cutting board on it right now. I use it very rarely now, honestly, because I, I have enough space, but occasionally I'll pull it out of my closet. I want to thank Chef Kathy Gold for this idea because she knew in my other kitchen I needed to have, you know, another surface, like an island, but I couldn't fit it. And this folds flat. That's why it's called an origami. And it folds up skinny and I keep it in my closet and it's sturdy. So I put a link to that rack in, um, in the Q&A and you, you can see it. You know, there really is a thing called decision fatigue and I had it. <laughs> and maybe some of you can relate to that. But what really helped was I had was twofold. One was that the footprint of my kitchen, what I liked, stayed the same. So I didn't have to overthink it. I just had better drawers to put things into. Um, but, you know, take your time. I did not figure out every single thing. And this may be, have been the, the case for some of you, or it may be an ongoing thing, but you know, until you start working in your space, it's hard to know exactly. For example, I um, I had something else where my countertop oven is now, and then I realized that's where it needed to be, but it meant moving this shelf up. So, oh, you know, by by working in your kitchen, you're going to know what you need. Now, in terms of materials, I wanted some, I wanted a countertop that was impervious to stains. I actually took samples of these materials that I was sent and I smeared ketchup and red wine and chocolate, of course, all over them. I chose quartz for this new kitchen. I had granite in the old one, um, the former one. It was old. It was, I think, built 30 some odd years ago. This really cleans like a dream and it doesn't stain, but it is not heat resistant. So I have to remember to put something down. I've had Formica, I've had stainless steel in pro kitchens and granite, and I've had wood. I've lived a few places and one kitchen, my kitchen in Tribeca had concrete countertops. I like this one the best. I like the idea of stainless steel those are always in the restaurants and the schools that i taught in but it scratches and it's noisy so there you go what i was very much thrilled about because sustainability matters to me waste i don't like waste in food i don't like waste in life i gave um some i gave two appliances to who did I give them to? I have to think about that. But I gave them to um, an organization that, that needs those things. And then up until the open cabinet, those are my cabinets that were here. I had wood cabinets. They were dark. You saw that in the photo. Um, but there was nothing wrong with the wood boxes. I had someone come in to check before I spent the money on having new doors made. Uh, had a wonderful cabinet maker named Sophie. We just, she made new doors with easy clothes. We made them a little bit longer to look more modern. And I didn't have the expense of new cabinets. I didn't have to wait for new cabinets and I didn't have to throw something in the landfill. So that thrilled me. 
My floor didn't change at all. We patched where necessary by taking some of the, it's a, I have a bamboo floating floor. It was here when I moved in from a closet. And I didn't use any kind of fancy pullouts in my drawers, um, both for cost and because I thought I need to live here and see how things go. So that worked. You want to have, make sure you have enough outlets, as many <laughs> as you can. I, I didn't add any. I had things there and I have an outlet right here under my counter. That was very easy because my refrigerator used to be over here. Now, sinks really matter. As, you know, uh, baking pans, sheet pans are very large. So I liked the, thing, the sink that I had. It was divided and it wasn't divided evenly, but it couldn't be reused. So I found a very deep sink with a divider. Again, not even, but the divider itself is low. So I can put something big across it. Now, I hadn't realized that the deeper sink would add plumbing costs. So you really want to think about everything. Still, it was worth it. I was very happy with that. And remember, from paper to on-site, expect changes. And I don't necessarily mean if you're doing a renovation, but I mean, you know, if you're sketching out different ways that you can think you can use your kitchen more efficiently, you really need to measure. I had a gap between the refrigerator and the end. Uh, I'm going to push this out of the way now. This cabinet and here. And so we built a very skinny cabinet that looks very intentional. I hadn't thought about where I was going to put my cutting boards and rolling pins. And I have a place for that now. So I'm super happy about that. And I think that I have talked enough. So I'm going to, I want to get to your questions here. Um, and also any suggestions that you might have, you know, we all learn from each other. So if you have any suggestions about setting up your kitchen and, or anything else, just put it in the Q and A. Hi, Char. Speaking of Chef Charlene, there she is. It's nice to see you. I bet you got some more snow than I did in the city. So Chef Char is asking, and and some of you probably know Chef Char. She is an instructor at Ruby and has probably graded some of your papers. Char wants to know, when baking oil-free, which do you think is best, safe, and most reliable for getting good results, parchment or silicone? Char, that's a great question. And I am a big fan of parchment. I have a lot. I buy big, big boxes of parchment. They live up there <laughs> and cut to fit. But I really... Um, you know, I know that you're doing oil-free baking. And here, for example, are some little silicone cupcake tins. Well, tins, they're cups. I bought these originally when I was doing a lot of travel teaching. What I do with these, however, is I put a parchment liner inside. And it works really, really well. I like this with the parchment liner better than using plain parchment. I will caution people that if you're making a larger cake, say a bunch cake in a par in a silicone bunt pan or a larger cake in a silicone cake pan, the the batter has nothing to climb, nothing to grab onto while it's rising and it will be a fail. So I hope that helps Shark Take care. Don't shovel. <laughs> Let your kids do it. Hi, Brenda. Brenda wants to know what are my top three must-haves for vegan baking success? Well, my I would say that I would take the word vegan out and say for baking success, there are a couple of top things to have. And I will have to use more than, I will have to offer more than three. So I have a tray here. 
I think you have to have an electronic scale. I have this one, which I can toggle between gram weight, volume, and milliliter. So it's super handy. I also have, you see, I have my baking one, my baking drawers right here. I also have this one. And I have this little teeny one that's called a jeweler scale for very small amounts that wouldn't register on either of these, maybe agar, for example. You certainly, so let's see. So that's a scale, number one. <laughs> number two, in, and that's not in the order of importance. They're all important. You want to have oven thermometer, at least one. I have two in my main oven. And I have one in my countertop oven. Your oven, no matter how new it is, and, you know, top of the line may not be correct. When you set the dial to 350, you don't know that it's 350. And definitely allow more time to preheat. Don't, when you hear that ding, I guarantee you when you have an oven thermometer in there, you're not going to, it's not going to be at temperature. So that is another thing. I don't use a sifter, but I use a strainer for dry ingredients. I have one for wheat flour and one for gluten-free, and that's very important to me. I also have a lot of sheet pans. These are quarter sheet. I have half sheet. I have full sheet. Full sheet does not fit into my oven. But I do have um, a lot of these eighth sheet pans, which are really great. So those are, oh, <laughs> and then you can see I have, you can't bake, and particularly vegan baking, any baking, with a, without a variety of whisks, wire whisks, different sizes, some to aerate, some not to aerate and then i like to have a variety of heat proof spatulas so i've got these are the ones that i buy and then offset spatulas behind me i have less you i have a couple of containers like this i've got some others but um i think that those are very important items to have in your kitchen. I hope that helped Brenda. Hi, Cynthia. So Cynthia says, I want to thank you for all your instructions and lessons. Your mise en place, your life was the first instructional video I watched on Ruby. Oh, great. And Cynthia says it was great. Probably the best start I could have. That's very nice of you, Cynthia. I'm glad you found that helpful. In Ruby, at Ruby, across all all of our courses, mise en place is something that we really talk about a lot. And believe me, what it means is having everything ready before you get started. So maybe your chocolate has to be chopped, your nuts have to be roasted and cooled, all your ingredients are laid out. You know, if you're making a pot of beans, your beans are soaking perhaps. But you can, you can play a little bit with savory food. If you're making a batter-based dessert and you realize when you've mixed your batter that you don't have any baking powder or baking soda, that cake is going to be a very sad cake. So I take this concept of preparation into my life and did an event called mise en place your life which as you heard cynthia watched everybody here is registered with ruby now and you can go into our really great library of live events with all of our instructors and get lots of information and many of the live events oh i see patrick thank you patrick put the link into that particular one Many of them are podcasts now, too, so you can listen to them. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. Ellen says she just ordered one of my books. Can't wait to read it. Well, I hope you like it and let me know what it is you make. Which book? Hi, Marie. Marie has a question about a home, starting a home bakery. 
if you are limited on funds, what would be the first thing you would suggest to start a home bakery? Well, Marie, you're going, you know, we have this kind of saying, so, so the culinary people have a saying, and it is TBD, tasty but deadly. <laughs> and that means, and that really applies to people who are making food in their home that aren't licensed. So you're going to need to check every municipality has different rules for starting a home based business and i'm assuming or i'm going to assume that you have already checked that out excuse me i need a sip of water here so you want to check that out and you are going to have to pay for licenses and inspections and so on so that is what i would say first start with that you need to um have some kind of a certification uh, of your you know safe serve or some of the others so good luck with that do a lot of looking do a lot of research and then you can get going hi diane diane says my kitchen is basically an alcove with a smaller than full-size oven that was very common in new york where she stores some pots and a refrigerator and counter space means a cutting board over the sink well Diane, I have used a cutting board over a sink, and I think it can be very efficient. And then when that's what you have, that's what you have. See if you can pull your pots out of your oven so you can use your oven. Maybe you can hang them on a wall um, or in a closet near your kitchen and think about that. But Small doesn't mean not efficient. It can be efficient. I have a pot rack on this on this wall here. I've got my knife rack hanging, even though I have more room now. And I can remember a live event or some filming that I did where I actually did have a big cutting board over my kitchen sink. So go ahead and give that a try. Jenna wants to know how to substitute for oil in dessert recipes. Jenna, that's a really great question and a question that I hear pretty often. Uh, in Essential Vegan Desserts, we have an entire unit on substituting for oil in dessert recipes. There is no one formula that I can give you so that you will be successful because like egg replacement, there is no one size fits all when you're doing this. Some of the substitutes for oil that are commonly considered are fruit purees, applesauce being one, you wanna think about the flavor profile. They help bind and they help add moisture. Um, so it is absolutely possible to do this, but your result is always going to be a bit different from a dessert that has oil in it. For example, I have a muffin that I really like. My grandkids call it, um, they call them Framas Power Muffins. And um, they're in my cookbook, More Great Good Dairy-Free Dessert. So it's an oat flour, it's an oat muffin um, for... I think 14 large or at least 24 small muffins, there are just two tablespoons of oil. That's not a lot, but I know for some people who are fully oil-free, that's too much. So the other day I cleared off and I decided to test that recipe. I divided it in half and I did half with one tablespoon of oil instead of two. And the other half, I used tahini, which I thought would be a good sub for the oil. And the tahini muffins were delicious, but they got a little bit soggy. They, they were just different. They were a little bit denser. So this is why we really take a deep dive into this in essential vegan desserts. Um, Patricia's asking to show the link for the live events. So there it is. 
<laughs> it's right under your question. Charlene has an interesting, an interesting question. She says when she dries her cookie sheets and cake pans, it turns the dish towel gray. What does that mean? And what kind of pans should I buy so that won't happen? It isn't. <laughs> what it means is that your pans, which are aluminum, have oxidized. And they oxidize. You never want to put your sheet pans, your aluminum sheet pans. I've got so many here in the dishwasher or your cake pans in the dishwasher. They're aluminum. Aluminum is something that I keep out of my life to the extent that I can. For example, I don't use aluminum foil ever directly on food. I use an aluminum free baking powder, but I do use aluminum cake pans and baking sheets because they conduct the heat the best. I line my sheet pans and cake pans with parchment liners and I dedicate one or two sheet pans for vegetable roasting. So they get darker. And sometimes I want my cauliflower and my broccoli to be directly on the pan, not on parchment, but I do use parchment most of the time. So I use, um, what you're seeing is just oxidation and it's not dangerous. It makes your dish towels look icky. And you can really wash that off with some soapy water. I use a product called Barkeeper's Friend on my pans with a rubber kind of a, not, not stainless steel. Don't ever use stainless steel on those pans. And, or you can use some water and vinegar to clean them. So that should happen. I mean, that should help you. That should help you. Arvind has a question also about a no oil recipe. He wants to know. How do I make whole food plant-based pastry with that oil and vegan butter? You really can't make a pastry dough, as far as I know, that's going to roll out and be flaky without oil or vegan butter. But what you can do is make a pie crust that is has dates and nuts and coconut, if you want, or dates and nuts and seeds, and blend that up and do what's called a cookie crust, just pat it into your pan and you won't need any oil or vegan butter. So I hope that helps. Hi, James has a question. What's the best soy replacement? Well, James, I will say <laughs> that I have been eating soy for something like 30 years and I'm doing fine and I really like it. But unless I recommend that unless someone has a soy allergy, they stop worrying about it because it really is very healthful. If, however, you cannot have soy, then I use oat milk. I use oat milk a lot because there are always people who are avoiding soy. There are people who are allergic to nuts and rice milk for baking, except for a few little um non-baked desserts rice milk doesn't have enough protein so i think that oat is number one and you can use almond milk you can use cashew milk and that really works really well if you can't have tofu you can make something using white beans for example aruna oh aruna <laughs> aruna says i've got a great chocolate cake recipe but it has a lot of butter in it and it eats kind of dry. So that doesn't sound great to me, that it eats kind of dry. I am really known for, if I may say so, this cake, which is vegan. So it has no butter in it at all. It actually has not got too much fat in it. It has about, I would say, four tablespoons of oil. I use extra virgin olive oil or what am I using lately? I'm using sunflower oil. I really love it. And this cake is super moist. And this was my breakthrough cake. So this cake was developed something like 30 years ago. And people who are not vegan 
love this cake. It's a very moist cake. So you can find the recipe. It's called the chocolate cake to live for. I, why don't you give that a try? A chocolate cake that eats kind of dry, that's not a nice chocolate cake. Rita wants to know what's a good alternative for coconut milk and oil. I use very little coconut milk. If I mean coconut oil, if at all, I prefer extra virgin olive oil for desserts, except for my Italian desserts where, you know, the olive oil flavor is a plus. I use um, one that's neutral, but coconut milk is, you know, has a lot of fat in it. And if you're going to substitute it, you're going to need a plant milk and you're going to have to add some fat to your plant milk. I hope that helps. Elizabeth A says, many of the chocolate recipes I find use nut butters I don't like. Where can I find a cake or brownie re recipe that don't use nut butters or tahini? Well, Elizabeth, I actually have, you know, I haven't seen that. So I don't know where you're finding your recipes. But I think this is a good time for me to remind people that going out into the what do we actually call it? You know, Googling everything and finding recipes that are random from people you don't know is not a good idea. I have cake and brownie recipes that don't use nut butters or tahini. They use flour, they use cocoa powder, they use a sweetener, and they use plant milk, and they use some kind of fat and no nut butters or tahini. So you should be able to find that. Hi, Laura. Here's my friend, Laura C. You may have seen her beautiful trifle on Instagram, artfully plant-based and Ruby plants shared it. So Laura's question is, while I have a variety of functional cookie sheets, I'm going to splurge on new ones for baking macaron. Oh, that's great. That's great that you're going to be learning to do macaron. Um, Laura, I can't think offhand. Of, I like Nordicware makes a nice one. There are a bunch. So I'm going to add a link here to um, the, the sheet pans and cookie sheets that I like. Now, I don't use cookie. Well, that's not true. Let me step back. I like using sheet pans these kind of sheet pans with very shallow sides for my cookie sheets i do have two that don't have any sides but i use them very very rarely so laura you want to get a nice heavy cookie sheets and i will get the link onto here and to you aruna says thank you can't wait to try your chocolate cake i love chocolate cake well you can see I like chocolate too. <laughs> Laura has another question. I'm considering going from a knife drawer to the wall mount. I really love having my knives hung up like that. I find it very handy. So the tip is to have to buy one where the magnet is really strong and to make sure that it is put in the wall safely. It's, you know, that's it. They, you want one where the magnet, the magnetic force field is really strong. I just love it. I think it's safe. My knives are always there. Every once in a while I take something off and, you know, I take the knives off and I clean it, but it's really great. So I think you will like that. Cheryl wants to know what are some pantry must-haves for baking success. Well, Cheryl, you know, you want to think about what it is you are going to be baking, but basically you want to have eight all-purpose flour, whole wheat pastry flour, the whole grain flour stay in your refrigerator, a variety of liquid and granulated sweeteners, some plant milks, cocoa powder, both alkalized and non-alkalized, and um, also some sea salt, pure vanilla extract. And um, 
I like to use organic cornstarch and arrowroot and agar. So those are those are definitely must have. Students who come into essential vegan desserts are given a list of in, of equipment and ingredients. So Cheryl, let's see. Ellen says, are there some sweets that do better with freezing? <laughs> She can't leave an entire pan of brownies on the counter because her husband and I tend to eat them. Hello, I get that. Brownies, or I can speak to my brownies, but most brownies freeze absolutely beautifully. All of my cakes, all of the cakes in Essential Vegan Desserts and in my cookbooks freeze beautifully, freeze beautifully. So do that, but label them so you know what you've got in there. Regina wants to know, the brand of butter that Artisan uses for croissant. I think she said she's using BioLife. I believe that that's what she's using. Cheryl wants to know, have I baked desserts using fresh herbs as, such as basil? I love this question because yes, <laughs> I have been doing, and this is, it is a trend to have savory components in vegan desserts and desserts in general. And I've been doing this for years. I did a, a what I called a fruit soup and salad. Uh, this is actually an assignment in essential vegan desserts because agar, which is vegetarian gelatin, it's a sea vegetable and it is not something new and made up and weird. It's been used in Asia for millennia is our replacement for gelatin. And I infused the fruit juice with thyme and basil and oregano and it was delicious i've actually just did one with dried mushroom powder and i love it i love it so go for it uh just remember to allow enough time for whatever liquid you're doing to infuse with the flavor or i actually do um a shortbread cookie where i chop up rosemary and it's delicious Nathaniel is asking about tips for optimizing refrigerator and freezer space, particularly with an eye toward the many chilling steps involved in pastries. That's a great question. And I'll tell you, you know, now I have this wonderful unit and I, oh my gosh, I went, <laughs> I went and I looked at refrigerators and freezers and I took sheet pans with me. And I wanted to make sure that I would have as much space as I could to put a sheet pan in my fridge if I wanted to, and particularly the freezer. So the French door refrigerators, which is what I have, um, sometimes the freezer space is difficult to get, you know, a pan in. And I found one that was great. So I would say, you have to organize your refrigerator and freezer. I go through my pantry. I go through my fridge and freezer every week. And when I am doing a baking day where I have to chill pastries um, in and out, in and out, I make sure to reconfigure my freezer and refrigerator. So that's a great question. I will tell you that I had, you know, a much smaller refrigerator with a top freezer before I did my renovation and I bought a small refrigerator with a very tiny freezer for my back room because I really needed it. And this time of the year, I'm in Philadelphia, <laughs> my terrace can be my freezer, but that's not gonna help you. Cheryl wants to know what I think about bread machines. I don't actually use one, so I don't have an opinion about that. Um, if anybody else does here, you can put it into the into the chat. Valentina is asking, other than zucchini, pumpkin, carrot, and apple, what other vegetables and fruit? N Wait, oh, uh, you know what? I'm looking at two questions at one time. Can be used to bake cakes, muffins, and brownies. Um, people are using sweet potatoes quite a lot in cakes and muffins and brownies. Uh, the Japanese, sweet potatoes which are white inside are so sweet that in asia people actually freeze them and eat them like a ice cream pop and chef char told me that she 
freezes them and puts them through her Jonas machine to make frozen uh, desserts, which is really great. I'll tell you that Rip Esselstyn and Jane <laughs> and Anne have put kale in their cake. I don't do that. So any, you know, I, I use prunes. I know they're called dried plums now, but I'm, Chef Char and I are sticking with prunes. And I use um, prune puree in many of my chocolate desserts that just, adds a this is something that they've been doing in france for many years is uh, adds a wonderful flavor and don't forget about dates dates are very very sweet so frank says i've had a very nice oven for the last three years which includes a proofing reservoir that needs to be filled with water do i need to be using this feature when baking i don't use steam when i'm baking cakes and muffins um, maybe when you're you know if you're using if you're baking bread yes but definitely not for cakes um mary Jo wants to know the best way to clean silicone bakeware yeah it can be a problem i have some small brushes including some toothbrushes i put them in soapy water i have a container and i'll fill it with soapy water and put the silicone bakeware in there and then scrub to get the you know the cake crumbs off so that definitely works and then dry them right away sandra has a question what can be added to baked desserts such as cookie to make them crispy oh so that they have a similar texture and taste as cookies made with dairy products that isn't an ingredient. That's a technique. <laughs> That's a technique. And we have lots of crispy cookies that we're making all the time in essential vegan desserts. So no, it's not an ingredient. It's a technique. And we th there shouldn't be any problem. Desserts, <laughs> I had to stop and think for a minute. Desserts that are made with dairy products and desserts that are made vegan today are you know that side by side you can't really tell that is assuming that the dairy the that the desserts made with dairy products are made well i've had some dairy desserts that don't taste good diane wants to know is it better to decant dry ingredients or leave them in the original packaging and i would say that it it just depends i have you know i have these containers here just because it's easier for me to decant um i keep everything airtight and labeled so i tend to decant but you know i use i use jars i don't go you know i love to go into the container store or watch those shows on tv where everything's matchy matchy and i just i can't do that so i want to be more sustainable but you, what you want to do diane is make sure that some of the ingredients your whole grain flowers your nuts and your seeds and flakes for example are kept cold patrice is asking what's light with light and i think what i meant to say was like with like so you keep things that are similar together and then you don't have to go running all over the place. Mary is looking for tips on baking in an oven that's supplied by propane gas. I have never done that. I've never baked in um, an oven that's supplied by propane. Mary, I have baked in ovens with gas. You know, an electric oven really to to me and many people would or a lot of the experts say that the electric ovens hold the heat best i was very used to a gas cooktop and when i moved to philadelphia and there was no gas in this building i was really sad but now i learned to love a radiant heat cooktop and in fact when i had an opportunity to get my new range you know i thought about induction because they're great but I had pots and pans that I did not want to give up. No, no, no. So I stuck with the electric radiant cooktop. 
when here's a tip for people with small kitchens i don't usually keep it there but this is an induction a portable induction cooktop that i use very frequently so i would say make sure that your oven has enough of the gas make sure you have an oven thermometer there and just do a lot of testing and see if that is helpful. Are you having a problem with your oven, Mary? Irene wants to know if I'm recommending fruit paste to substitute for sugar. I'm not necessarily recommending it at all. I'm saying what I said earlier and bears repeating is that there are people who want to use, who want to limit the amount of sugar that they use, myself included but I am making desserts. So they have to taste like dessert. Fruit paste can substitute for a portion of sugar. That's for sure. But there are many different kinds of sugars. I have, I use organic cane sugar, which still contains some of the molasses inherent in the cane. I use coconut sugar, date sugar, maple sugar, and whole cane sugar that has all of the molasses that's inherent in the cane, depending on the recipe. So if you're working with a recipe that was old fashioned, those were often too sweet. You have to find the sweet spot. <laughs> my boss once said, you know, when I took all the sugar out of my brownies, you may have heard this recipe, this story before, but he said, Costigan, you're making brownies, not brown bread. And I put some of the sweetener back in. So yes, yeah, some amount of fruit paste, consider the flavor of that. Um, Patricia says soy should be organic or non-GMO. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. Um, Frank says, since you brought it up, why would I want to roast my broccoli cauliflower without silicone or parchment and place them directly on the pan? Um, I was experimenting with that in, for a to get more browning. And I decided that there wasn't enough of a difference to dirty my pan without the parchment. So I'm back to parchment. Thanks for bringing that up, Frank. And I have one more question right at the five o'clock hour. Irene wants to know what suggestions do you have for substituting egg whites in a recipe? Well, you may have, many of you may have heard, and I don't know, Irene, if you've heard of aquafaba, which just means bean water, and it refers almost always to the liquid in which chickpeas were cooked. And this whips just like egg whites to make meringues, for example. In essential vegan desserts, one of the assignments is to make a baked Alaska with a piece of cake or brownie or something and some vegan ice cream and then whip the aquafaba and torch it and it's fabulous so there are there are ways to use that as an egg white substitution but it's going to depend on your recipe you know i always wish that i could say this is the formula for substituting egg whites for example but it really in vegan baking or vegan desserts in general is going to depend on what it is you're making. So those were great questions. I really want to thank you all for those wonderful questions. I hope everyone is happy and well, is going to have a great rest of the evening or day, depending on where you are. And I hope to see many of you in February when I'm going to do my eighth or ninth Valentine's Day live event. And this time I'm focusing on mini bites because I don't know why not. That's what I like, delicious desserts, and I happen to like them smaller. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much.